The Meteor did great service for the RAF, and it's up there with the RAF's iconic aeroplane. This lowly prototype aeroplane, which first took flight in 1941, may not look particularly significant. But the E-28, built by the Gloucester Aviation Company, contributed to aviation history being the first aircraft powered by a jet engine, invented by RAF officer Frank Whittle. What emerged from it was the only Allied jet to see combat in the Second World War. The first RAF squadron to be equipped with Meteors was number 616. After carrying out their initial training at Farnborough, they transferred to Manston Aerodrome, Kent, in the summer of 1944. This is the Gloucester Meteor, the first jet fighter the Air Force had. Uh, thought of initially, believe it or not, during the Battle of Britain uh, in August 40. Uh, a firm requirement was issued in 41, and the first Meteor flew in 1943. Uh, the first jet, uh, as it turned out, to enter service with the Royal Air Force. The company uh, that Whittle was involved with for his jets, power jets they were called, uh, had an association with Gloucester. Uh, and so it was, it was the engineers at Gloucester that were trying to uh, bring together an airframe with his engine. Uh, and they got the go-ahead and they developed this airplane. The Meteor was designed by George Carter, who began work on the project in 1940. Its standard armament was a set of four 20mm Hispano cannons. The Mark I, the version that first entered service, had a top speed of 410 miles per hour. By the plane's heyday, it could reach a speed of 600 miles per hour. But its most important feature were the engines. In 1943, it was powered by a pair of Rolls-Royce Welland engines with 1,700 pounds of thrust. Well, it allows you to develop more speed. Uh, it's relatively economical. Uh, you can use it to high level. Uh, I mean, some later piston engines went to high level, but the jet had much wider potential. Uh, you didn't have a big thing going around in the front to create drag, uh, which, because a propeller is, is creating th uh, thrust, of course, to make the airplane fly, but it's also creating a degree of drag. You don't get that because there's nothing on the front of the airplane. But the jet is a far more efficient engine. The first thing the pilots really noticed after they got the engines going was the fact that they could see forwards because it had this tricycle on the carriage, the uh, nose wheel, rather than the wheel at the back, the tr uh, which the Spitfire had. So it was. The Spitfire would sit up as they taxied. It'd be very difficult to see out the front. They'd weave to see. No problem with the Meteor. Uh, and so th they found that very straightforward. The takeoff, once you'd got the throttles open, you just sat there, you got to the right speed, ease the stick back, and off, and off it went. With this plane, the absence of noise and vibration in the cockpit, coupled with the simplicity of the controls, greatly impressed the pilots. I spoke to one or two of them uh, years ago, and th the thing that struck them most was it was quiet. There was no noise, there was no great roar from this Merlin engine in their Spitfires, uh, because the minute they started trundling down the runway, of course, the noise was all behind them. They had four 20 millimeter cannons uh, in the nose. We can see them quite clearly here. Uh, the gun pack is underneath, so all the, all the cartridges uh, the spent cartridges sort of fly out the bottom. It was all self-contained, uh, four powerful cannons. It was a good fighter. When it first came into service, it was rushed in, the Mark I version, which only lasted six or nine months, to combat the V1s, which of course were posing a huge threat uh, in August of 1944. By the time it was getting into its stride, of course, the menace was beginning to go away because the Allied armies were capturing, as they moved east, capturing the V1 sites in the Padicale region, for example. But it did have some success. And the very first success was by a chap called Dixie Dean. And when he closed up on the, um, the V1 in front of him, at low level, over Ken, his cannons jammed, which, which happened quite a bit in the early days. So, undaunted, he accelerated, 
went up alongside his V1, put his wing underneath the stubby wing of the V1, and he tipped it up. And the gyro in the V1, of course, toppled, and the thing spiraled into the ground and crashed near Tunbridge Wells. And that was the first jet kill of the RAF. No guns. After the war, it became the standard day fighter. Uh, the other airplane day fighter was the Vampire, but there were more Meteor squadrons. Meteor Type F8s came from Tangmere and were led by Wing Commander Crowley Millie. Flight of 24 from Biggin Hill, led by Squadron Leader Button. It served just about everywhere the RAF were, the Middle East, the Far East, lots of squadrons in Germany. It served as a day fighter, a night fighter, a photographic reconnaissance aeroplane, uh, and a ground attack aircraft. So very versatile, lots of squadrons, including the auxiliaries, the weekenders, 20 squadrons of those, and it was the mainstay of fighter command until really the Hunter appeared in the mid-50s. The first British aircraft constructor show to be held at Farnborough took place in September 1948. Although piston engines were still in evidence, jets were very much to the fore. Next to the standard Meteor stood the first Meteor trainer, recently returned from a successful tour of Europe. In it, Gloucester's chief test pilot, Bill Waterton, had given several continental countries their first experience of a jet plane's speed and grace. The Gloucester Meteor was the Adam and Eve of jet aviation, the star of a journey that could see an aircraft such as the Lightning push the boundaries of aviation design and speed. But for many, it would recall the past. Those youthful days when they first encountered the sheer roar of its power. To my generation, of course, this was hugely exciting. Jet engines, and we all wanted to fly one and be one. 